Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Whenever I speak on this issue, I'm mindful of the personal stories and situations that people find themselves in and of the responsibility that we all have not to add to any pain or anguishing, anguish that they may be experiencing. The Pro-Life Campaign is a human rights organisation made up of people from all walks of life. Some of our members experienced abortion in the past and regret the decision. Others are parents of children who contemplated abortion only to change their minds at the last minute. It would be hard to be involved in the pro-life movement for any length of time and not be deeply struck by the incredible stories you come in personal contact with. Stories of hope and survival against the greatest of odds. Stories of pain, heartbreak and regret. Mary Kenny's story represents the experience of many families in Ireland today. At a recent event in Dublin, she said, if I had listened to the pro-choice line when I discovered I was pregnant, I wouldn't have my beautiful three-year-old daughter, Holly. And those pushing for repeal of the Eighth Amendment would have no words to console me for the loss I'd have suffered. I am so grateful that the Eighth Amendment was there when I faced a crisis pregnancy, and I dread to think what might have happened if there had been an abortion clinic just down the road from where I live. I know many people who say they owe the life of their child to the Eighth Amendment, and as a result, they have gotten involved in the pro-life movement. Having to plan a trip to England gave these parents time to think a bit more and change their minds and decide against abortion. Some of these families have become very close personal friends, and when I meet their son or daughter, I'm not meeting a choice. I'm meeting a child with the same rights as you and me. In 1967, when abortion was introduced in Britain, we did not understand as much about the development of the unborn child. Most of us today have seen the amazing ultrasound pictures of our own children or those of family members. These images reinforce the truth that the unborn child is a human being, a human life with potential, not a potential human life. Sinead McBreen, speaking about her daughter, says, Grace is a beautiful, strong, funny, and makes everyone who meets her fall in love with her. She continues, Grace also has Down syndrome. It is the part that makes everyone love her even more, but it is also the part that would make her a target for abortion in many other countries. When Sinead, who is here with me today, was pregnant with Grace, she was told her daughter had a so-called fatal fetal abnormality with zero chance of making it to birth. Sinead says, we were pressured to abort Grace and told by medical staff in Dublin, why are you carrying on with this pregnancy? It's not going anywhere. She continues, I was made feel like a foolish mum and told that I already had healthy children at home and that we should get an abortion in England. If Sinead felt pressure to abort Grace with the Eighth Amendment still in place, how much more intense would that pressure be if there was no Eighth Amendment? In England and Wales, over 90% of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. In Iceland, they have reached their target of aborting 100% of babies diagnosed with the condition. Denmark has set a goal of being a Down syndrome free society by 2030. A friend of mine, shown in this slide, Heidi Crowther, who has Down syndrome, has spoken publicly about her concern at new screening tests introduced in Britain, making it easier to detect and target unborn babies with Down syndrome. Just this week, she addressed the Nuffield Committee in the UK with a question. What is so offensive about Down syndrome? And have you considered how this testing is making me feel? I think that's a question each one of us has to answer. Abortion is the ultimate discrimination but in many countries, it has become so deeply embedded that it is rarely spoken about publicly. How many people in this country have heard about the woman from Ireland who bled to death in the back of a London taxi after an abortion in a Mary Stokes clinic? Very few is the answer. Or what about the story of Dr. Faneuil Darty, who was struck off the General Medical Register in the UK after almost killing a woman from Ireland in a botched abortion, also in a legal, fully registered Mary Stokes clinic? 
Scandalously, these stories receive very little media attention here. Take another example. Last year, some of the most prominent abortion providers in the US were filmed laughing at the story of a baby's head getting stuck during an abortion procedure and an eyeball falling on the ground, which one doctor remarked was a sign that the procedure was going well. Sadly, stories like these are not isolated. Two recent congressional investigations in the US established beyond doubt that leading abortion providers were illegally profiting from selling the body parts of aborted babies for research without the knowledge or consent of the mothers. Don't take my word for it. I strongly encourage you to read those congressional reports. At a pro-abortion conference called Don't Mention the A Word, English abortionist Dr. John Par Parsons remarked, when performing abortions, you may see things that are not very pleasant. That is why we are not very keen on people observing abortions. I was recently asked if I would have a journalist join me at work who wanted to write for the Daily Telegraph. After discussing with other people, we decided this was probably not a terribly good idea because it does not really help women who have got to make the decision to hear how unpleasant it is. Women contemplating abortion are told their unborn babies is nothing more than a clump of cells. The accepted routine practice of those who facilitate abortion is not to encourage women to look at the ultrasound monitor when receiving counselling before the abortion. So much for trusting women. I'm going to quote one more person. Emma Beck was an artist. She died by suicide, and in her suicide note, she directly referenced aborting her twins, saying, I see now that I would have been a good mother. I died when my babies died. I want to be with my babies. At the inquest into Emma's death, the presiding doctor said it was clear that abortion can have a profound effect on women. I set out these examples before you to highlight the fact that there is a whole side of the abortion debate that is never talked about. As outlined in our submission, in the space of a month from June to July 2016, a national radio station afforded 81 minutes to the campaign for repeal of the Eighth Amendment and just four minutes to the pro-life side. This very one-sided coverage forms the backdrop to the discussions here at the Assembly. It is no basis for making a decision on the Eighth Amendment. When it comes to discussion on the Eighth Amendment, there is a sense being created that we must do something, and very often that translates into calls for repeal of the Eighth Amendment. Instead, we should be building on the life-affirming vision that is at the heart of the Eighth Amendment. We should be focused on issues that unite our society rather than divide it. On any given night, there are more than 20 homeless pregnant women on the streets of our cities. This national scandal could be resolved and sheltered accommodation found if the political will existed. We should be working together as a society to make Ireland a pioneering centre of excellence for perinatal palliative care to help families of babies with a life-limiting condition. And as a country, we should be putting additional facilities in place to conduct research with organisations like the Lejeune Foundation in France, which in, uh, carries out research to enhance the lives of children with Down syndrome and improve their quality of life and outcomes. The Eighth Amendment has had a hugely positive, humane and life-saving impact on society. Our abortion rates are only a fraction of those in Britain. A massive one in five pregnancies are aborted in England and Wales. In other words, for every four babies born alive there, one is aborted. Repealing or amending the Eighth Amendment would absolutely lead to more abortions. <coughs> Ireland, with the Eighth Amendment, has also shown it is possible to prohibit abortion and still be a world leader in protecting the lives of pregnant women. I call on you, the members of the Citizens' Assembly, to reject the notion of holding a referendum to repeal or dismantle the Eighth Amendment. Usually referendums add to human rights protections. Repeal of the Eighth Amendment, however, would target a particular group of human beings and strip them of their power. Human rights don't get old. They don't pass their cell by date. Unborn human beings are just as entitled to protection today as ever. This is a defining moment for our nation. The result of your deliberations will have profound implications for Ireland for generations to come. No country is perfect, but we have every reason to be immensely proud of our pro-life laws. <coughs> As a country, we can summon up the best within us and do more to create a more welcoming environment for expectant mothers and their unborn children, instead of following other countries down the road of abortion. Without the right to life, all other rights are meaningless. 
I thank each and every one of you for listening to this presentation.